slide. Oh, nice cursor. Oh, there we go. Cool. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present TypeDefs to you. Uh, as we've seen with Kayla, TypeDefs is one of the projects we have at Statebox. And in order to present or introduce you TypeDefs, uh, I will have to go through this um, process of explaining what are types exactly and why do we use them. So I see that a lot of people already use programming languages which have types. Um, and in order to build an intuition towards uh, using TypeDefs and what TypeDefs is, we're going to use another analogy. So most of you know that types are annotations, like textual annotations you put in your code, and then you run your program on a computer, which you call a compiler, and it will tell you if your small annotations are correct or not correct. So let's see types as shapes. We're going to say that uh, this is a type, and we have values that fit the type. And values are, for example, this blue pentagon that fits in the blue uh, in the Pentagon outline, you can have different values that fit the same type. So for example, the string hello and the string world both fit the type string. It turns out you can't put a number when you expect a string. So this, for example, would be an example of a type error. You can't fit a square in a pole of, of shape Pentagon. Uh, now we're going to take a very, very concrete example. Uh, who here knows Java or C? Very good crowd indeed. <laughs> so this is an example of how you could imagine doing a linked list in C. Uh, like it's a textbooks example. Uh, you have a structure and it has a value and has a pointer towards the, the remainder of the list. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to replace all the names by shapes. So a list will be a circle and a value will be a square. And I'm going to do the same thing for another language called Java, which is also very popular. And I'm also going to replace the, the, the text by shapes. And if you look at uh, those things, uh, you can already tell there is something similar. Uh, it turns out, uh, in both cases, you put alongside together a value and another list. Now there's something else uh, that is a bit hidden that you have to know when you do Java and C, that when you have this small star, it means it can be a pointer or it can be a null pointer. You don't know. And it's the same thing with uh, Java. It turns out if you have a reference, it could be an actual reference or it could be null. And so in order to use types, sometimes you would like to use types to represent those things. And how do you, the question is, how do we say it can be something or it can be null? So we're going to use a convention here and say, what is, what is the unifying concept between those things? And the unifying concept for null is that you can have only one value that fits this type. It's, we're going to call it the point. So when you have something or null, we're going to say it can be something or a point. Right? And we're going to use the syntax for this. We're going to say pipe says it's either circle or it's either the point. And we can generalize this by saying if we have a type that can be multiple shapes at the same time, it's either a circle or it's either a square or a hexagon or a star or anything. So if you rewrite our, our program such that we represent all the possible states that we want to model, we have for a linked list, a value, and then either nothing, because there is no, no continuation to the list, or another list, which is another circle. And if we remove all the craft of Java or C, we have, we have class braces, we have semicolons, etc., uh, we end up with this. And we can do better. We can remove all the names and just keep the structure. So this means the circle has the shape square and either circle or point. And from this, you can tell that uh, those two structures look the same and are all both built from this unifying representation. So the shape of list in C resembles the shape of list in Java, such that we can build a unifying syntax for those. Now, we, we defined already three combinators. We have the point, which is the one thing that can exist in only one form. We have the pipe that says either this or that. And we have those braces syntax with comma that says we have to have both of these at the same time. Uh, except there's a, there's a catch. Um, in our definition, there is no way to represent empty lists. So if you take the Java example and I say list equal new list of three and null, uh, this is a list of one element, the list of element three. There's no way of saying no list or empty lists. So we have to change our definition. And if, again, if you take a textbook example, 
you would have something like this. A linked list contains um, a value. Oh, this is wrong, but it's fine. Uh, a value or, or um, sorry, a node which contains a value or the following uh, remainder of the list. And again, this, in this case, if you make a list that is empty, well, here you have uh, a new linked list which represents nothing, and here a new linked list which has a length three, and a remainder that represents nothing. As you can see, those two definitions are the same, right? Because the next part of the list is empty. And if we change, if we massage this version using our syntax, we remove the names, and I've called the node type hexagon here. Remove the names, use our small thing to, to remove the ambiguity that it might be something or null, and then use our record syntax with the, the, the funny braces, remove those names again, and you see like, here this, this is simple that we can fit it in here, right? So we just inline the definition, get rid of hexagon entirely, we end up with this thing. And then we can even simplify more, remove the parentheses, move this around, and we have this very nice shape. Um, and this, we're going to say, is what defines a list. Because as we've seen before, from this we can go to the C definition and the Java definition, and vice versa. From those, we can build this syntax that we represent a list. However, C, some people, you already know, but some people don't know about other languages than C and Java. And they would be surprised to see that, for example, Rust has another syntax to represent lists. So Rust uses enums, which, interestingly enough, if you look at Swift, is closely related. If you look at Haskell, is also closely related. So I'm going to do like a small trick in cinema where you put different things uh, one to the other, and you see that they look the same, right? And you have a small animation between those. And uh, again, just like we see with uh, C and Java, those look like each other. So we're going to do the same exercise. We're going to massage one of those definitions, which all look the same. I'm going to take the Haskell one because it already uses the pipe to say one or the other. So in Haskell, you just remove the names, replace list by circle, remove <coughs> empty by point, and remove the value by the square. Uh, then use our um, bracket syntax, and then align everything. Does this look similar? Does this, does this remind you of something? It is, in fact, the same results that we got from the Java and C implementation. And so you can see now that from this one shape, we are able to compute and reduce this to this one program or this one program. Those are actually the same program, but defined in different languages. And just for funsies, let's make one last substitution. So we have this nice syntax with combinators. If you replace the pipe by Plus, and if you replace the bracket and comma by star, and if you replace the points by one, which, which is intuitively what we define the point, point is uh, the one value that can only exist once in one shape, uh, we have this. So many of you have gone probably through high school and know algebra, and um, in algebra you don't use shapes, you use letters, but it's the same idea. We have an algebra here, we have basic combinators, so in Type depth, we add zero, and we add application variables and mu, which we're not going to talk about here, but are details to implement more complex and interesting types. And so this would be the definition that we've seen in type depths. Uh, type depths, uh, list in type depths would be defined like that. Now, why would you use type depths? Type depths allows you to use the syntax to create generic definitions for types that are valuable and usable in every language. Every language star, I'm going to say every um, language used in production, uh, aka every language which doesn't have dependent types, so every language. <laughs> and I'm going to say, like, the reason you should use type depths is because it's simple, it's well understood, and it's flexible. Why is it simple? Because you have only those constructors. You have zero plus times one, and everybody understands that. Why is it well understood? Well, behind it is an F algebra, which is a very old mathematical um, object, which is itself well understood. Uh, we're not using new technology here. We're actually using old tools and we're building on top of them. Because what happens is we realize that those things already exist. They already have a shape, they already have an understanding, they already have semantics, they already have properties, and we can just reuse them to our advantage. Right. <laughs> And they are flexible in the sense that if tomorrow a brand new programming language appears, we will be able to generate code for this because we can represent every type asterisk. 
every type ever. Uh, and why would you actually use this in production? So one example is, imagine you have a client on a server and you have a generic definition for a user which has access rights to modify things. And well, you send the definition from the server to the client or from the client to the server. Well, you can generate this code in Java and turn this code in PureScript, for example, out of the same definition, which would be up here, right? So a user is a name and a privilege. Um, and a privilege is an access right, which is defined as this sum here. And this generates those definitions. And uh, since this is a bit of wishful thinking, because we don't have quite the syntax, as uh, Yele mentioned, we have a uh, Lispy syntax for now, this is an actual working example. So if you put this into try.typedef.com, you get this thing, which is even better than just the type definition. The type definitions are generated, but those are serializers and deserializers such that you can send in binary format your data across the wire and get it back and deserialize it in the same shape and get the same type that you typed uh, in type defs in your language. And this will work again in every programming language ever. So I would like to encourage you to go and try to type defs.com and go and type defs.com and try it out for yourself. Look at the syntax, look at what it can do for you and try it out. We also accept contributions in this repository. Uh, but really, the, the message is, once you have this, uh, there is infinitely many things you can do. So the example with uh, clients and server is one of them. Uh, in Statebox, we plan to use them to annotate wires and do type checking on those. Uh, there is, again, this is an old tool that has infinitely many possibilities. Uh, I encourage you to go ahead and try them out. I hope I have convinced you that uh, types are not as scary as they look like, and there is a universal way to define the shape which is useful for you. Thank you. Uh, since we're running late, uh, I encourage you to ask questions to Fred, which is here. Later. And Fab and me. I'll probably hang out through the poster. Okay, let's go with you. What's the challenge with uh, expressing independent type languages? You need sigma types, and uh, the F algebra we have doesn't support them right now. But you can use it in dependent types. Yeah, you can. You can't. You just can't what represent the dependent types. You can do some stuff, but not all the stuff because they have you can't just can't define the thing. Right? <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Next one. <laughs> 